Hey, welcome back to the Computer Hardware and OS Essentials lecture series. I created these custom lectures based on A plus certification program, but with few enhancements to improve your IT technical skills and knowledge. So if you haven't seen my previous videos, I will post a link in the description for the playlist and I recommend that you go through those lectures so you have a comprehensive understanding about computer hardware. And this would be our eighth lecture in which I will cover graphic processing unit or GPU. The primary objective of this particular lecture is to learn what is the purpose of GPU, integrated versus dedicated GPU, cooling and power system considerations when you are adding on additional GPU cards, common GPU technical issues, video systems in laptops, and a broad overview of monitor technologies. So what is a GPU? Graphic processing unit or GPU uh, is a term that we typically interchange with the term graphic card. However, they are not the same. A graphic card not necessarily uh, you know, uh, tra translating to a GPU or GPU doesn't really mean a graphic card. And I will explain that later uh, on this particular lecture. GPUs were originally designed to accelerate and rendering of 3D graphics. And the GPU technologies use what we call the parallel processing. And modern day GPUs are embedded in either uh, on both uh, personal and business computing. Uh, and either uh, as a part of an integrated circuit within the motherboard and the processing unit, the CPU, or as a separate card. GPUs uh, used in high-end um, systems uh, include the gaming, video rendering, especially with 4K and 8K videos, especially like, for example, this video that you are watching right now, is a 4K video that I use a NVIDIA GPU uh, to render uh, the in 4K, so the video rendering. Creative production, such as 3D, 4D, uh, cartoon rendering, uh, CAD design rendering, etc. Specialized business software, such as CAD design programs used by uh, engineers and scientists. Artificial intelligence or AI, machine learning, ML, and deep learning, etc. So these kind of applications can take the power uh, and the capabilities of GPU processing uh, for uh, each one of these particular needs. And high performance computing, also known as HPC. So those include uh, research done by NASA or your local uh, research laboratories or universities. They can use GPU capabilities to run their applications and computing needs. So what is a GPU? GPU were, were originally designed to accelerate the rendering and 3D graphics. And GPUs are typically, and at the very beginning, uh, came out as a built-in um, you know, system or built-in chip uh, that goes on your uh, laptop or desktop computers. And they are used both in personal and business computing needs. But the modern day GPU cards or graphic cards are capable of doing gaming, video rendering, creative production, artificial intelligence, etc., etc. So GPU, the primary purpose of a GPU is to accelerate the rendering of 3D graphics. But in modern day, it can be used for variety of purposes. GPU versus graphic card. So GPU or graphic processing unit is a computer component that can process, render, and deliver graphic capabilities, as I mentioned in my previous slide. Most motherboards contain integrated GPUs and can deliver graphics without the need of any additional components. Especially with laptop or mobile devices, the GPU is integrated onto the motherboard or to the chipset, such as Intel, NVIDIA, sorry, Intel um, AMD chipsets. The graphic card, however, refers to an add-in board that incorporates a GPU. So the graphic card GPUs are more powerful than the integrated GPUs more powerful power consuming. So you need the power uh, supply support uh, for the, these graphic cards almost always. 
uh, often requires more physical space uh, because you will be adding a card on top of uh, what uh, already uh, in, inside your case and more expensive than integrated graphics. GPU uh, is the component while the graphic card is the add-on board with a GPU embedded in it. So if somebody asks you or during your A plus certification exam, what's the difference between a GPU and a graphic card? Basically, graphic cards contain GPUs and GPU can be contained within embedded onto the motherboard or the processor. However, the GPU is the actual component or the com it's a computer component that can process, render and deliver graphic capabilities while the graphic card is a more uh, capable GPU uh, card that is an add-on component to the motherboard that allow you to have a better graphic rendering capabilities compared to onboard system. So that's the difference between a GPU and a graphic card. So the GPU is a computer component that can process, render and deliver graphic capabilities and the graphic card contain a GPU that can deliver better performance and capabilities than an embedded integrated uh, GPUs. So keep that in mind. So GPU is not the same as a graphic card. Graphic card is not the same as GPU. So you should know the differences, even though uh, in society we may use both of them interchangeably. So let's look at the integrated graphic processing unit or integrated GPU. Majority of desktop computers, laptops and servers have integrated GPUs. So even if you do not install a graphic card, most of the uh, desktop computers would be capable of delivering, uh, delivering graphics uh, through its integrated uh, GPU capabilities. Thin, uh, they are thinner and lighter systems, reduce power consumption and lower system cost because they are integrated and doesn't require an additional PCIe uh, or card uh, that would have to be you know, added onto the motherboard. Uh, these integrated graphic processing units are much uh, uh, cheaper and less consume less power and thinner and lighter as well. Hence, that's why laptops always almost have integrated graphic cards, sorry, integrated graphic processing units. So most of the enterprise and small business servers uh, have integrated GPUs uh, because typically servers do not have the need uh, for a, a graphic processing unit uh, uh, that is has to be dedicated card in most environments. So for most business environments, uh, whatever the you know server that you're going to be uh, you know installing will have uh, integrated graphics, and that would be more than enough uh, for these type of enterprise and small business environments. And on the right hand side, I have a a, a diagram of how the integrated uh, architecture of Intel processors. Uh, Intel 8 gen processor works. So basically the Intel chipset would have integrated graphics support and with a compatible motherboard, you would be able to install a, such a chip and those motherboards will have a integrated graphic uh, output such as this HDMI port right here shown here. Uh, and uh, that would allow you to directly plug in a monitor onto this uh, compu uh, computer, this motherboard, without the need of having a graphic card. So this is the architecture that the Intel uh, 8 Gen use. And here's another motherboard example where you have two uh, other options instead of HDMI port. This one has a VGA out and a DVI out. And this uh, output allow you to uh, connect a external um, uh, monitor external display uh, with a, a, a similar processor such as this Intel i7 processor which has the graphic capabilities already built into it. Discrete graphics processing unit. So the discrete uh, GPUs are also known as the discrete graphic processing unit and these are basically graphic cards. In industry we call it a graphic cards sometimes and sometimes discrete graphic processing unit uh, but in um, in the consumer level, we typically use the term graphic card. So discrete graphic processing unit is another term for a graphic card. So they are designed for GPU intensive or resource intensive applications with uh, extensive performance demand. 
So those uh, include, uh, you know, those demands include preventing rendering issues in gaming. So that's why we use a, a graphic card. Eliminating frame drops or corruption in 4K or 8K rendering of uh, your videos. Reducing the jitter on live demonstrations and testings of 3D CAD models in engineering uh, environments, for example. Providing the computational capabilities needed for AI, ML, and deep learning algorithm modeling and requires very high uh, uh, concurrent calculation processes. So uh, whenever you need these uh, high uh, concurrent calculation processes, you can uh, utilize these uh, graphic cards, also known as discrete graphic processing units, uh, to do the job. Uh, also, um, there are situations that you may have to uh, insert a graphic card to a server. Uh, those situations are typically uh, situations such as high density streaming. So we have servers that host uh, st uh, streaming games uh, and uh, graphic acceleration support uh, are required in certain server uh, situations where if you have a hosted um, CAD uh, program on uh, enterprise server, you may have to go with the server GPU such as the one uh, shown here, which is the Intel XG310 uh, graphic card that is specifically designed for servers to handle such uh, capabilities. So as I mentioned before, Typically, enterprise and business servers do not need discrete graphic processing unit, also known as graphic cards. But there are certain situation the uh, you know servers may need a graphic card. In that situation, you will go out and buy a graphic card uh, that is specifically designed uh, for such applications in server environments, such as the XG310 uh, from Intel server uh, GPU family. So that's what. Uh, you will be uh, installing on a server if it is uh, if the server needs high density streaming capabilities or graphic capabilities for whatever the reason but typically the integrated graphics is more than enough for servers and does not need a graphic card uh, but you know that is a possibility for gaming and uh, other application desktop application you would use a very high powered graphic card such as this one uh, from asus and it is a much larger uh, footprint and uh, however provide much better capabilities compared to even the server type uh, gpus and again i want to mention the discrete graphic processing unit is another term that we use to describe a dedicated graphic card so that's what you need to get out of this slide Graphic cards compatibility. So when you're buying graphic cards, uh, you need to remember that not all PCIe are created equal. So currently, uh, the current standard in the market as of 2022 is PCIe 3.0 and PCIe 4.0. If you are buying uh, a graphic card in uh, 2022 July, uh, you should be leaning towards PCIe 4.0. Uh, if you are building your gaming rig uh, or if you are building a high-end uh, business uh, computer, end-user computer uh, that will be using 3D modeling or a 4K rendering for, uh, you know, video production uh, uh, business needs, for example, I would recommend that you stick with PCIe 4.0, the latest, te latest technology. But however, in 2022, you still can buy motherboards that only go up to PCIe 3.0. Uh, but keep in mind uh, that do have an impact on the highest level of performance. It's not going to have a much big issue with like, for example, if you're running like um, uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator at the highest rendering level, currently as of now, July 2022, there is no difference between PCIe 3.0 and PCIe 4.0 because they can, it's, it doesn't do more than 3.0. However, there are maybe applications and games that can utilize the capabilities of PCI 4.0. So I would recommend that you go with the latest technology. The other thing you need to consider is the riser cards may be used when uh, there is not enough physical space, uh, which is very common in enterprise rack mountable servers uh, because they, it is, they are very thin and they're specifically designed to go into the racks. Uh, therefore, you may need a riser card that will give you a 90 degree angle uh, and that will give you the capability of inserting a, um, a graphic card at a 90 degree angle 
and I have discussed about uh, Risa card in my previous lecture. So if you haven't uh, watched my previous lectures, I would recommend uh, that you go back and watch those lectures uh, for get a better understanding about how Risa cards uh, work and what are Risa cards, etc., etc. So anytime also you have a compact case, you may need a Risa card. Uh, or uh, the other option would be the PCIe ribbon extensions. So these are often using compact gaming cases that would uh, allow you to not only a, a ability to mount your um, graphic card uh, at a 90 degrees, but you can mount it in any angle uh, as long as it is supported by your case because those are ribbon cables as opposed to uh, a riser card. Again, these are all considerations that you need to take into account uh, with respect to your use case scenario. Cooling and power system when it's come to GPUs. So integrated GPUs do not require any special considerations on cooling and power. So you just have to refer to your manufacturer's guidelines such as the Intel or AMD and just make sure that you install a compatible um, you know, uh, cooling system for your processor. That's all you need to do. There's nothing much you need to think about when it's come to the integrated GPUs. Graphic cards or GPUs uh, that are embedded onto graphic cards requires additional power and produce extra heat. So anything that requires additional power typically produce extra heat, right? So therefore it may require an upgrade of power supply unit. So if your PSU is not capable of providing power to that additional uh, uh, graphic card that you just inserted, you may have to replace your entire power supply unit. May require change of motherboard as well because supported PCIe architecture may be only up to 3.0, but you want to get the capabilities of PCIe 4.0. In that situation, there's no other option other than to re replace your entire motherboard in that situation to support PCIe 4.0. Expansion slot availability is another reason why you may need to uh, replace your motherboard. You may not have uh, enough PCIe slots or you may not have any PCIe slot that can be uh, you know, um, capable of uh, taking in a PCIe uh, 4.0 graphic card, for example. So in that case also, you need to replace your motherboard. Maybe your other PCIe 4.0 are occupied for something else. In that case situation as well, you need to think about replacing your motherboard which add on to the cost of uh, your build. Keep that in mind. Air cooling is more than enough for most applications, including games and 4K rendering. As far as I can see, if you build a good system with good air circulation, you can run 8K video rendering and you can do high-end gaming with no liquid cooling. In my opinion, you should be okay. It's not the best setup, but it will be okay. You will be you will be hitting uh, th thermal throttling a little bit uh, at some parts of 4K rendering uh, because I have tried that, but it's not going to make a huge difference. So that's why you may uh, want to consider adding liquid cooling in situations you are doing especially 4K rendering or high-end applications because that way you won't hit the thermal throttling issues, right? So you still can do 4K rendering without liquid cooling, uh, but you, you can uh, add that uh, as an additional, you know, um, you know, way of cooling things. So when I mention air cooling, what I mean is not the air cooling of the CPU. I'm mentioning here is the air cooling of your GPU. So uh, like in terms of 4K video rendering, I highly recommend at least uh, AIO, uh, all liquid cool, uh, you know, all in one liquid cooling for your CPU, but not so much for the graphic GPU, not for the GPU. You don't necessarily need it because the, your pro chip set, which your processor gonna get heated up more faster than your GPU in 4K rendering in my experience, in my personal experience, in my expertise in IT, what I have found is 4K rendering and video rendering and things like that. It has a bigger hit actually on the CPU than actually the GPU itself. So it's just, it's just the way it is. Uh, so when I'm talking about air cooling here, I'm talking with respect to GPU, not respect to your CPU. I would recommend actually uh, liquid cooling for all PC builds in 2022 because the prices have gone down significantly. And I have discussed about um, you know CPU cooling and how it works on my previous lecture. So if you haven't seen that, go back to my YouTube channel and watch that. 
Consider adding additional case fans also uh, or replacing the current case fans with high airflow uh, case fans to support your new GPU. That's another thing that you can consider. So this is actually more important than liquid cooling your GPU. So make sure that your air circulation in the case is good and you may want to add high airflow uh, case fans as uh, therefore uh, you will get a better circulation inside the case uh, hence giving you a better uh, cooling ca capabilities for your GPU uh, at a lower cost than just uh, you know turning your GPU into liquid cooled GPU right keep that in mind so when I talk about air cool here I'm talking about the GPU cooling and uh, yeah so typically we don't do liquid cooling for GPUs so, uh, unless you are an enthusiast or you really want that little bit of additional uh, you know performance uh, for your 4k rendering or business use case selecting a graphic card so chips are produced by companies such as amd nvidia and intel those are the three major companies of uh, graphic uh, processing uh, chipset producers amd nvidia and intel and even intel is mostly um, associated with integrated graphic uh, chipsets uh, rather than dedicated uh, you know graphic cards uh, except those server Intel server graphic cards uh, the, in terms of manufacturers these are the, the producers of the chipsets and AMD Nvidia and Intel the manufacturers of uh, the, the graphic cards include EVGA uh, PHY Sotec uh, ASUS uh, Intel, NVIDIA, uh, AMD2 uh, as well, so etc, etc. So those are the manufacturers of the graphic cards itself. So these manufacturers such as EVGA would be using either AMD or NVIDIA uh, chipsets, the graphic chips uh, produced by these companies to build their graphic cards. Questions to ask your end user or, uh, you know, end client or your management team uh, would include things like, um, you know do you have a preference of gpu graphic cards because maybe you are building a, a computer for your gaming client and they have a specific graphic card uh, preference and in that case that's something you should actually uh, you know look into because they are the one who's paying you money they are the one who's paying your salary uh, so if they have a specific uh, you know you know if they allow asus uh, graphic cards you know don't try to convince that the evga is better because as a computer IT technicians, you know that the ASUS and AVG are comparable products and they have a similar failure rates and uh, capabilities. So if the, your end user like a specific uh, card, let's say ASUS, just give them ASUS. Like don't argue with your end user, it's not worth it. Uh, what is uh, the another question you can ask is what is your budget for GPU or graphic card uh, for the system? So if you're buying a laptop for your um, end user and you're recommending laptops, uh, you know the budget may play into uh, uh, play into the factor of uh, the integrated graphic units that they could buy, uh, or a gra if you're building a desktop PC or an end user, um, you know, a business PC, uh, you can uh, you know the budget may play into uh, you know play into you know a factor of this uh, whole equation. Another question you can ask is uh, what applications or activities would the desktop computer or server be used? This is a really good question that a lot of IT technicians uh, and uh, people forget to ask. Because I seen uh, people who are, let's say, um, I seen a situation where a, a customer in this situation, I was selling computers. A long time ago, I used to be, uh, work at Best Buy uh, and uh, you know I was selling computers. I'm just a computer salesperson. And uh, this lady who is a, uh, a PhD student who is working on a, uh, a, a urban design and planning was sold a computer by Dell that has no graphic capabilities. So this is why you need to ask, you need to have really good people in your company. So when I was working at Best Buy, my manager, my, my organization used to uh, be very more forthcoming with that information. We would ask questions such as, you know, what applications are you gonna use? What activities are you gonna use, you know, use this laptop or a desktop or a server computer? Because reason for that is Dell didn't ask those questions. 
I mean, maybe this, I mean, most likely this lady probably went to the Dell website and just order the laptop without thinking about it because she never spoke to a Dell representative or nobody and they just order the device. What happened was that she was, she was trying to use uh, an application used by University of Calgary that has a very high graphic processing needs. So nobody asked the question what application or activities that you will be using that laptop. So that laptop has no capability of that using that graphic processing you know, requirement. So I had to recommend her to return the laptop and reorder from Dell a better capability uh, graphic processing laptop or buy a laptop from uh, Best Buy that I'm going to recommend that has a better graphic capability. So please, please, please not only ask the above questions right here, you should also ask what application and what activities would the laptop, desktop computer or the server will be used by your client. So if they are using AutoCAD programs, they can use a cheap laptop. They can use a cheap desktop. They have to buy a laptop that has a integrated or dedicated graphic capabilities that can handle whatever the software they are using. Like if they're using even accounting softwares that not all integrated uh, graphics uh, can su support certain uh, processing needs. If certain accounting programs have uh, cost controls that comes with 3D diagrams that shows where the cost uh, is being used, right? Such as uh, project management softwares. I've seen project management softwares that have 3D diagrams. So keep that in mind. So you should ask what application or activities the your end user or client gonna be using for. The other one is what operating system OS would be installed. So this is not a very important question to ask in most scenarios, but it sh you should still ask that question because there are certain graphic cards, uh, including graphic cards produced by NVIDIA and AMD, uh, that have a really hard time installing uh, drivers onto Linux-based operating systems. So maybe your end user is planning to use Linux. So let's say they want to use Ubuntu desktop or Ubuntu server or with the GPU, like a, with the GUI uh, for the Linux. Uh, so in that situation, you need to think about how hard is it going to be for you to install that graphic card uh, drivers onto that Linux system. Because not all Linux systems uh, have the software and the drivers for all the uh, graphic cards produced by EVGA, Sotec, ASUS, Intel, etc. So keep that in mind. So you should ask that question what operating systems uh, would be installed. In terms of Windows, as far as I know, in 2022, uh, EVGA, PHY, ASUS, Intel, NVIDIA, all of them support Windows 100%. They have the drivers, they have the software. It's very easy to install. In fact, you don't even need to install the drivers. It's gonna, uh, Windows gonna auto detect drivers and install it themselves as soon as you insert the graphic card and reboot your computer. But with Linux, you need to take into those considerations. For example, Linux Red Hat server, I found uh, sometimes have a hard time installing NVIDIA graphic drivers and I had to go out of my way to find those drivers to install an in NVIDIA cards. Like typically uh, your end user may, you know, your end user not gonna install things like Linux, uh, you know, Red Hat server and use a NVIDIA graphic card, but there are situations like an example that why I had to do that is that I was working for a geophysical company that do geophysics, uh, uh, you know, 3D rendering of uh, subsurface geology. And they were using uh, Linux uh, Red Hat server and they had NVIDIA graphic card because they need a graphic card support. And I had to find a way to install those things and it was very painful. So keep that in mind, you need to ask, uh, you know, your client about operating system because there are situations there are situations people would use Linux Red Hat, for example, uh, with a high-end NVIDIA graphic card, which you need to support. An example would be the geophysical company that using uh, Linux uh, Unix type uh, calculations on their uh, geophysical analysis, but they really do need the NVIDIA graphic card installed on that Linux system. Other factors you need to also consider, the factors that you need to consider is the need versus wants and balancing that with the budget. So your end user may come and say, I want this, I want this, I want that. And then the budget is like $1,000. 
and you need to make sure that you know you talk to your kind of end user or customer about yeah, their needs versus wants. And if upgrading the current configuration, you need to think about um, you know the motherboard support. Uh, you know the current configuration or motherboard support need to be taken into account when you are upgrading a currently running system. Also, you need to uh, think about the limited graphic card support on enterprise grade servers, uh, HP, Dell, Intel, and many other uh, IBM, uh, for example, server manufacturers don't have support for all of these uh, type of graphic cards. I mean, the operating system and the motherboard may support it, may not, you may not even have the room, even with a riser card uh, or a ribbon cable that you know you won't be able to insert that graphic card into that limited space. So keep that in mind with enterprise servers. Crossfire and SLI. So AMD Crossfire and NVIDIA SLI are two technologies used for multi-GPU setup. So it basically combines two or more graphic cards into a single GPU using parallel processing. It allows graphic cards to work in tandem to provide higher performance and graphic processing power. So the, what this is gonna SLI and Crossfire are gonna do, it's gonna combine multiple graphic cards and they're all gonna act in unison uh, in tandem uh, to provide you with you know much better capabilities and performance. In, Situations where you need to use Crossfire and SLI, the motherboard must be compatible with that particular technology. Graphic card must be identical, in other words, same model and same series, and your power supply should be able to provide enough power to all of these additional graphic cards that you'll be uh, inserting. So they look like these, like in here we have one, two, three, four, uh, GeForce GTX graphic cards with the SLI uh, bridge attached right here. Uh, and in here we have two, uh, uh, you know, uh, graphic cards uh, with AMD uh, Crossfire uh, connected with this ribbon cable uh, that allow the Crossfire type of um, uh, combination. So this this type of combinations, the Crossfire and SLI allow multi GPUs to work together in tandem. However, in 2022, it is not recommended as modern GPUs have improved significantly. And it is not recommended to use in office environments or, or in um, you know in home use environment for gaming or anything like that. There is no reason that you would ever need this kind of setup in 2022. Uh, however, there are very small percentage of the market that this type of SLI and Crossfire technologies may be in use. And this kind of setup is mostly in, in 2022 is being used in research labs uh, or uh, in other specialized environments uh, in use case scenarios. So there are maybe situations such as the NASA or the, your local research laboratories, such as your local universities that use um, this type of setup. Uh, I seen this type of setup still in use and set being set up, for example, at the University of Calgary Engineering Research Laboratories uh, because they are uh, researching computer engineering and other like such as civil and structural engineering systems that require this kind of high processing power. But other than that, the Crossfire and SLI is pretty much um, no longer a consumer uh, need uh, at this time in 2022. Installing and configuring graphic cards. So when preparing to install an adapter card or any type of adapter card, it doesn't even necessarily has to be a graphic card. You need to verify the card fits an empty expansion slot. So because we are focusing on graphic card in this lecture, so you need to just verify that your graphic card fits an empty expansion slot. If not, make sure that you have the additional components such as those riser cards uh, or uh, those cables, the ribbon cables that can allow you to put the graphic card in any angle uh, you like as long as your case supported. Verify that the device drivers for the OS are available. So as I mentioned, about, mentioned to you before about the Linux uh, situation, so make sure that you before you buy the graphic card, uh, you know, spend that money, verify that the device uh, drivers for the operating system that you are about to install is available. So the most modern graphic cards have drivers and software support for almost all consumer operating systems, but you should still ver verify, especially when it comes to point Linux. Verify the current power supply unit or PSU can provide the additional power needed. 
So if you don't have that capability, you may have to replace the PSU as I mentioned before in our previous slides. And backup important data that are not already backed up. No matter what component is being replaced or reinstalled or added on to your uh, system, always, always back up your data. Right now we are installing a graphic card that has nothing to do with your hard drives, but still, you should back up your data that, that being saved onto your hard drives because reason for that is anything could go wrong. As a technician, you always should have backups. And please know your starting point. So you have to have a basic idea about where you're gonna start and uh, in the you know setup of this new graphic card. So general directions to install and a graphic card is shown here in this uh, page. Uh, so. I try to put everything, cram everything into a one single page. So there's a lot of information, but I will simply go over them, uh, you know, just by reading off the slide because this is what the general directions recommended by the A plus certification program. So read the documentation for the card as well as for your motherboard as well, I would recommend. We are uh, anti-static strap as always, shut down the system, unplug power cords and cables and drain the power. So you can, most motherboard can drain the power by holding the power button. Some motherboards have a LED light that indicates uh, whether the, the, the all the power has been drained after you unplug and hold down the power button. So after unplugging it, hold down the power button of your desktop computer, uh, laptop, or your uh, you know uh, server until the all the power is drained out. Locate the slot. Prepare for installation and insert the card into expansion slot. So make sure that you use, uh, you know, common sense. So you don't jam it into the expansion slot. You gently insert the card into the expansion slot until the PCIe uh, slot lock get clicked on. Anchor card to top of the slot with screws. And for large graphic cards, you may require support brackets or posts. For example, on my uh, GPU, I have this uh, metal post with a plastic arm uh, that holds the graphic card, uh, uh, you know, the, the end, the most ex external end. The reason for being the graphic card is too heavy and it's gonna sag on the motherboard and can damage even your PCIe uh, slot if the graphic card uh, saggle uh, too much. So you can use uh, uh, certain support brackets, uh, specialized support brackets or uh, a post, like I use a post that will hold the weight of your, uh, you know, big graphic cards. Then you make sure that you connect any power cables. Some graphic card needs just one power, uh, you know, uh, you know, connection. Some graphic card needs multiple power connections, such as three, four power connections. So make sure you plug in all of those power connections or cables. Replace the case cover. Plug in any additional uh, components um, that you have, you know, removed during the installation. Uh, then uh, start the system. So obviously you have shut down the systems at the beginning here, uh, which I haven't mentioned, but you know, in your, you have shut down the system, drain the power and you install everything. Now you're gonna start the system. Windows 11, 10, 8, 7 and Windows Server 2016, 19 and 22 should detect a new hardware device and attempt to automatically install the drivers. So. Windows will automatically install at least the basic drivers for your uh, graphic card as soon as you boot it up because Windows 10, 11, uh, 8, 7, as well as Windows Server 16 to 2016, 2019, 2022, all of those things can uh, you know automatically detect um, gaming or desktop graphic card as well as the server cards automatically and it can automatically install those uh, graphic uh, drivers. I, one thing I would also recommend before you start the system, I would make sure that you plug in your LAN connection or ethernet or network connections uh, so that if the Windows detect the card and the Windows uh, system, operating system doesn't have the drivers already, uh, they, it would be automatically able to uh, download it sometimes directly from their Windows servers. So make sure you have the internet uh, connected before you start the computer for the first time after you install in the graphic card. If a CD uh, came with the device, insert and run the setup program or install the drivers from a USB thumb drive or from the internet. So once you have booted up, uh, you should still uh, you know, update the drivers because these Windows drivers may be old 
uh, or may newer drivers uh, may give you more capability. So make sure that if you have a CD or the USB thumb drive or something like that, or you are can download the drivers from the manufacturer's website for your graphic card, go ahead and you do that. Uh, then install the relevant software such as NVIDIA GeForce Experience. Uh, this is recommended, but not necessary. So you may have a client that you hate NVIDIA GeForce Experience. In that case, you don't need to install that software, but it is recommended to install those software because that will uh, give your client the up-to-date drivers, sometimes automatic installation as well. You can set it up automatic installation, uh, just like a Windows, um, operating system updates uh, by installing this software uh, you your client will be up to date but it is recommended it is not needed you can just install the drivers directly from the either from the manufacturer's website or just use the windows drivers that automatically downloaded from the manufacturer um, and then done with it but it is highly recommended that you use the relevant so uh, you, uh, software comes with the uh, the graphic manufacturer you may have to restart the system uh, maybe even multiple times you may have to restart the system uh, in order to get all the drivers and the graphic cards going so if there are any problems with the installation uh, turn to device manager to troubleshoot and sometimes it may be necessary to go to bios or uefi and disable the integrated graphics in order for the system to detect the new graphic card so even after you connecting your monitors to the new graphic card and rebooting uh, your Windows or Linux machine, and if they don't detect it, and if the drivers are not working or something is going wrong, you may have to go into the BIOS and UEFI and disable the integrated graphics and then reboot again, and then it will get into the, the, uh, the dedicated graphic card and you will be good to go. Common GPU technical issues. So here are some few common uh, things that you might come across uh, in the field. Uh, flickering or sudden loss of graphic output signal. Uh, so you need to check your cables and especially the video cable and the power cables associated with your, uh, you know, the monitor and the desktop computer. Multi -monitor, in multi-monitor setup, we are dual, triple or quadruple monitors. Uh, loss of video signal on all monitors but one. So you may have a situation where you have the uh, GPU working and you have an image and you, you have the, you know, the graphics showing up, but only one monitor is working and the other uh, two monitors or three monitors are, uh, you know, going blank. In that case, uh, check the cables for each monitor and GPU again. Uh, and reboot your computer may actually uh, fix that or so those other additional monitors may get detected as a result and check for operating system updates and check the drivers or reinstall drivers so these are common causes of why uh, in a quad or dual or triple uh, monitor setup where all the monitors go blank except the main monitor uh, you know is online so in graphic cards where that has the capability of multi-monitor support without the proper drivers and software it won't be able to uh, support the additional monitors only the main monitor will be come online so this is a situation that um, you know you can fix it with the reinstallation of drivers newly installed graphic card would not power on uh, in that kind of a, a technical issue, uh, again, check the cables, especially the power cables in this situation, because right now the power uh, power is seems to be not working in the graphic card. So make sure the power is uh, cables are properly uh, inserted. Uh, check if the power supply unit has enough power to support the GPU. So the power supply uh, unit or the, uh, your power system is not good enough to support the GPU. Your motherboard may have some, some uh, uh, BIOS or UEFI configuration set up so that it automatically turn off uh, this type of uh, uh, devices such as the GPUs uh, in order to make the system go, uh, you know, boot up. So in that case, your GPU will not uh, power on but all the other components will still power on therefore you still have a working computer but you only have the integrated graphics uh, check if the graphic card is seated properly in the expansion slot so if you haven't properly inserted 
the graphic card into PCIe slot uh, and the PCI slot has you know clip on and hang uh, clip on to that graphic card uh, that may result in incomplete uh, seating uh, in that uh, case could also cause the graphic card to not to power on some or all of the fans of the graphic card is not running so that's another common issue technical issue that may come across in the field uh, so some gpus have built-in firmware that works with the drivers that automate the fan speeds and what fans will be uh, turning on so if you have like three fans on, on your graphic card uh, so the asus uh, graphic cards typically have a driver that will determine what to, uh, what those fans going to do that includes the fan speed as well as what fans going to be turned on like for example on my asus graphic card sometimes the middle fan uh, momentarily turn off and then start back on uh, so that is not a, a, a technical issue it is by design set it that way so make sure that you check the manual uh, check the driver software settings and make sure it is set accordingly and um, if the manual is saying that you know this is what is it is normal behavior you don't have to worry about it but if the manual never mentioned anything about like uh, you know uh, automated uh, speeds and fan controls by the firmware maybe you need to check um, you know the if the fans are burned out or something is wrong uh, also you need to check if the power supply unit has enough power to support the gpu and the cable are, cables are connected why because some uh, gpus uh, have multiple uh, power connectors and part of the power connectors will be used to power on the gpu and the separate power connector will be used uh, to power on the fans so if you have one of those power connectors that is powering on the fans are to unplug or not properly connected the gpu may still work but it will heat up a lot more and the fans may not work so make sure that all the uh, power cables associated with that gpu with multi-power connectors are properly connected and seated video system in a laptop so compared to a desktop or a server uh, system uh, the laptop systems are much more compact and have very limited capability in how uh, we can configure the gpu so typically whatever you buy directly from your laptop manufacturer is whatever the gpu that you're gonna end up uh, using however there are uh, situations that you can uh, do certain things uh, with uh, technical issues that you may encounter uh, with laptops so in situations where LCD panel shows a blank screen but power light is on on your laptop what you can do is you can look for the LCD cutoff switch or button on the laptop uh, try to use the video port on the laptop to connect to an external monitor and see if you can get an image on that external monitor uh, and if the external monitor does work that means the problem is with the LCD panel assembly, not with the GPU. Because in order for your external monitor uh, on your laptop to work, that the GPU has to work. So that means nothing wrong with the GPU and this is the LCD panel. Uh, this is the most common uh, technical issue with laptop uh, displays. Uh, typically the GPUs don't burn out, it's just the LCD panels that are going to get uh, burned out. So in this situation, we'll need to replace the inverter or the LCD panel. Flickering, dim or otherwise poor video. So that's another issue uh, that you may encounter with laptops. So to tips to solve uh, those problems with bad videos would be to verify the Windows display settings so that you don't have really dim, uh, you know, um, settings set up on your Windows uh, control panel. Uh, adjust the brightness of your uh, monitor, uh, sorry, or your laptop uh, screen uh, itself. Uh, update the video drivers because missing video drivers or outdated video drivers may also cause the same issues. And if the uh, cursor drifts on the screen on the when the mouse or the touchpad isn't being used, uh, try using a different port on the computer or replacing the batteries uh, in the uh, mouse. So if you are using an external mouse, that may be the issue uh, a flickering screen can be caused by bad video drivers a low refresh rate a bad inverter or loose connections inside the laptop so flickering videos can be caused by any of those items so you need to rectify those in order to fix those issues 
Replace the LCD panel in a laptop. So if the LCD display is entirely black uh, and you couldn't figure out anything else other than uh, you know you have decided that it is the LCD panel that is causing the problem, you need to replace the LCD assembly. If the LCD display is dim, the video inverter uh, might be the problem, not the panel itself. In that case, you need to check with the manufacturer before replacing the LCD panel. So in that case, you can simply maybe able to just replace the inverter as opposed to the entire panel. General direction to replace an LCD panel on a laptop includes the removal of the AC adapter and the battery pack. Remove the key, uh, upper keyboard uh, bezel and possibly the keyboard itself as well in certain models. Uh, remove, remove screws holding hinge in place and remove hinge cover. Remove screw holding LCD panel to the laptop. Remove LCD panel from the laptop. Remove screws holding the top cover and LCD panel. And disconnect all inverter and install the new one. And then you had to reattach the LCD panel assembly to the laptop and that should uh, get you back to, uh, you know, your uh, normal configuration. And here is an image showing the inverter uh, being exposed. And right now they have two inverters and these are identical inverters, but uh, you know, this is the newer uh, inverter. This is the old one. And they're just checking, make sure it is the correct inverter. Uh, before being installed so you push the panel out of the uh, the uh, the for, from the laptop casing and you just pull the um, you know inverter out gently without breaking these ribbon cables for example without pulling on these ribbon cables or these wires and then you're going to lift up the ZIF connector uh, locking mechanism before removing the ribbon cable so you'll have these connector locks uh, they are maybe slightly different from uh, laptop model to laptop model and you just push them out and then you will be able to uh, replace it with the new inverter. So this is just an overview of how you can replace the inverter. So if you're replacing the entire LCD, you will be replacing this entire assembly up here. Uh, you can get LCD screens with the inverter already uh, or you can use the current inverter and just replace the LCD. So this is how basically how you, uh, you know, do that. Monitor technologies and features. Types of monitors include LCD, OLEDs, and also we have projectors. Projectors are actually a type of monitor as well. So LCDs are also known as liquid crystal displays, uh, also uh, known as the flat panel monitors. And first used in laptops initially like long time ago. Uh, and at the uh, center of the layer is a liquid crystal uh, material and the layers are sandwiched between two grids of electrodes forming columns and rows and each intersection of those rows and columns form a pixel. So if somebody asks you what's a pixel, so basically it's a sandwich between two grids of electrodes forming columns and rows and the intersections of those columns and rows actually create a pixel. So if you have a dead pixel, you actually have a, a dead intersection of those rows and columns. OLED, which is the organic light emitting diode, uh, is uh, it's a type of monitor that uses a thin LED or light emitting diode layer or film between two grids of electrodes and does not use backlighting. So in LCDs, there is a backlight, but OLEDs, there is no need for the backlighting. Uh, does not emit as much light as the LCD monitors and therefore can produce deeper blacks and provide better contrast uh, work in dark rooms uh, and use less power than an LCD monitor. So it's slightly less power. It's not a significant enough to save a lot of uh, power uh, consumption, but it is still less power compared to LCD. Projectors used to shine a light that projects a transparent image onto a large screen. Those are typically used in like lecture halls or during presentations, and they basically use typically external uh, video out uh, from uh, your laptop or from your uh, desktop computer out and then pl plug it into a the projector connector right uh, these are also used uh, uh, you know external as well if the lcd or leds are not uh, mounted on a laptop they will be using your um, you know gpu uh, you know external out uh, connectors so 
Um, this is an overview of, uh, you know, uh, OLED, LCD and uh, flexible, uh, you know, OLED displays. Um, this is somebody, for, of course, Samsung Geeks, the company, the, the website, they made this thing. And this is a really good overview of that. So the LED, sorry, LCD, as I mentioned, it has these kind of polarizers and the glass, the liquid crystal, TFT glass. If, you, if it is a touch screen, the touch screen would have TFT glass and the backlight. And in OLEDs, there is no black backlight. So it's power saving. It's really good for mobile devices that is running on batteries, such as laptop computers, because it doesn't have that backlight. So it's considerably less power uh, usage, especially in a mobile environment, but not a lot. Uh, may make a lot of difference in a desktop environment where you have, a, uh, you know, the plug-in power connections, right? And then flexible displays. Um, this is very important for mobile devices such as cell phones, but it is also important uh, to uh, for, for uh, monitors, like desktop monitors. Why would you think is that? So one reason would be that if you have a gaming PC and you need to have a curved display or you have uh, the need to use a curved display in your work environment, such as you are doing uh, video rendering and you would like to have a curved display. That's one of the reasons why you would use a flexible OLEDs. But also, what happens if you have a multi-monitor setup and you have a bezels on the corners? Bezels are huge. Like for example, on mine, uh, I have a Samsung 24-inch uh, uh, monitors, I believe these are, and it has a, a you know thick bezel. Like it has a like a even this is a thinner bezel I could get right now in 2022 for a cheaper price. Uh, but with flexible display technologies, with uh, flexible OLEDs, you can bend the corners of your LED screen and put the electronics right behind it. So as a result, OLED screens can be bezel-less. So if you have like a multi-monitor display like I do with four monitors, for example, you would have no bezels uh, on each of those monitors as a result of bending of that display all the way to the corner. So that's why, that's why uh, uh, flexible OLED displays uh, are still uh, a good uh, technology uh, that being used even on desktop computers because you ha can have multi-monitor setups uh, with no bezels at all as a result of bending the display into the uh, backside of the uh, you know the, the monitor so that's why uh, you know this is a really good option but as of 2022, LCD prices have significantly dropped. OLED has also dropped, but not so much the flexible display. So they are newer technology, so it's a little bit more costlier than the others. Monitor technologies and features. Uh, so the, here's a summary of different uh, monitor technologies uh, and features. So things you should think about is the screen size, refresh rate, pixel pitch, resolution, contrast ratio, viewing angle, backlighting or brightness, especially with LCDs, uh, connectors, so what kind of option you have uh, to connect your um, monitor to the device and other features associated with that. So when it's come to the point screen size, so the screen size is the diagonal length of the screen surface in inches. Um, the refresh rate is the refresh rate that is the number of times the monitor can uh, you know, refresh uh, the 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 image or the the, the these LCD dots. So the refresh rate, uh, you know, uh, is measured in cycles per second. Uh, pixel pitch. A, a pixel pitch is a spot or dot on the screen that can be addressed by software. So the pixel pitch is the distance between the adjacent pixels on the screen. Uh, the smaller the number is, the better. Uh, this is not something that you typically see in documentation, sorry, typically see in advertisements, uh, commercials, but however, you do see in manufacturer's documentation. Uh, that will give you a good idea about how, you know, how good the monitor screen is. So the smaller that pixel pitch number is better it is. So again, this is not something typically uses in marketing, but it is still used in uh, the manufacturer's documentation. Resolution, so the resolution is the number of spots or pixels on a screen that can be addressed by the software. So the higher the resolution, better it is uh, for uh, your viewing, right? So the contrast ratio, the contrast ratio is the contrast between the true black and true white on the screen 
uh, the higher the contrast ratio in this situation is better so the resolution and contrast ratio is higher the numbers the better the weaving angle is another thing that is not typically marketed but is uh, available on manufacturers documents and maybe something that is important uh, in your use case scenario uh, so the weaving angle is the angle at which the monitor uh, becomes difficult to see from side so higher weaving angles are important things like like TVs and such, but not so much for desktop computers and servers. Uh, and some situations such as enterprise environments, maybe uh, you require to have a low weaving angles because that will increase the privacy and security. Uh, so if you're working on an enterprise um, lab lab for example you might buy even uh, even you know the panels that you can put it on top of the existing monitors that will decrease the weaving angle increasing privacy those are called like privacy screens for example uh, and this is also play important part in enterprise or business laptops. Uh, most uh, enterprise and uh, uh, companies would uh, uh, like to have low weaving angle laptops uh, so that it will increase the privacy. So if you have a business person in an airport working on a document, it's really hard for someone on a city next to them to actually look at the information on the screen. So this is so in, when it comes to my weaving angle, higher weaving angle is better for uh, certain environments such as like you know TVs and projectors and etc and lower weaving angles are better for other environments such as enterprise environment where security and privacy is very important backlighting or brightness that has to do with uh, LCD more than OLEDs because that's where the backlighting come into play because OLEDs doesn't have the backlighting connectors so uh, popular uh, options for connectors is VGA, DVI, I, DVI-D, HDMI, Display Ports, and Apple's Thunderbolt. Also, depending on the uh, desktop computer or server that you are using, uh, those connectors should be taken into consideration. Please keep in mind, even in 2022, some of the enterprise servers still only have VGA out built into the server boards uh, so keep that in mind if you're buying a, a monitor for your server so you should think about vga vga is still useful uh, but newer uh, enterprise servers now comes with hdmi outs uh, and uh, in desktop computers you will see dvi and hdmi and uh, newer versions of um, connectors uh, associated with that uh, other features that includes the moni uh, lcd monitors that can provide privacy or agile surface that has to do with the a uh, weaving angle you know weaving angle uh, has to do with that as well uh, tilting uh, or how you know, how much you can tilt uh, you know go up and down uh, for you know agility of that uh, you know the way that the monitor can set up the microphone input the speakers usb ports adjustable stands uh, perhaps even input uh, for your uh, smartphone uh, can be associated with the uh, monitor itself so if you have a monitor with usb ports like i do for my work from uh, dell those dell monitors have usb ports where i can plug in my uh, uh, you know office uh, cell phone uh, for um, you know for use it directly across the monitor so those kind of other features is some of the other things that you can take into consideration when it comes to my monitor technologies and features changing monitor settings so uh, settings that, that apply to monitor can be managed by using the monitor buttons, uh, function keys on the keyboard and also uh, Windows utilities. So you have Windows utilities already in Windows operating system you can use to change the monitor settings. The same thing apply for Linux as well. So, so for example, Ubuntu has some monitor settings already built in monitor utilities built into the Ubuntu desktop environment and you can actually use that to uh, manage those monitor settings as well. Using the monitor buttons, typically you can adjust the horizontal and vertical position of the screen, change the brightness and contrast setting and some uh, additional settings with certain monitors such as Samsung monitors where you can change um, you know, the settings based on different profiles for example. On laptops, the function keys are usually used instead of buttons because of the limited space. So you wouldn't have physical buttons on most of the laptops where you can change the monitor settings maybe on gaming laptops you have those things uh, so typical laptops you will be using the function keys associated with the f keys uh, you know you to change the monitor settings windows utilities can also be changed to monitor settings as i mentioned before at the up here as well as the linux uh, utilities as well
And that would bring us to the end of this lecture. Please make sure to thumbs up this video and subscribe my channel. Until next time, good luck with your exams and have a nice day.